All right, so we say good morning and greetings in Jesus' name this morning. It's an honor to be part of his family. It's an honor to, to be here this morning. It's an honor to, uh, to experience the love of Jesus in our, in our hearts and in our lives. Sorry, I'm not, I, I don't get my P's and Q's together here this morning. Our title this morning is, Our Response to Life. We want to challenge you this morning by saying it's so important that we understand that our responses are important to God. Let me give you an illustration. Start with an illustration this morning. I was in, in the kitchen. Um, we, were, we were working in the kitchen, and I hear Olivia screaming her head off out in the yard. And I thought, oh no, what's happening now? And I look out the window... She's in the playhouse just screaming like everything. And Nevin comes popping in, comes up running up on the front porch, and I said, Nevin, what's wrong with Olivia? Well, he says, the house is on fire. And I looked out. She is in the playhouse. He has the roof all ripped off this plastic playhouse. And I said, well, why don't you rescue her? Because he says, I need my Harry hat. He was given a fire hat, and he calls it his hairy hat. So he was running into the house to get this. His response to his little sister was, I need my hat. I can't rescue you now. We laugh because he carries this thing around, and it doesn't matter what he got, you know, whether it's a stick or a bent arrow or a piece of hose, he's fighting fires. All right, don't worry about my sister. I'll get her later. I need my hat first. Our response. We see and we realize that our response so many times is vital to the outcome. Somebody has said, our response is 90% of the situation where the situation is probably only 10% of what we're dealing with. I don't know if that's true or not, but the important part is that we realize that God is calling us and He's leading us and He's directing. We forget that sometimes when we are responding. We forget that sometimes when we're shedding His light. We forget that sometimes because as I shared earlier this morning, about that little lantern that we had. Alright? Well, I said, I want to crank that thing up. I want to crank that wick up so I can see further. And my father just kind of laughed at me and said, well, go ahead. He said, that's not the best idea, but go ahead. And after a bit, it starts getting dimmer and dimmer. Why? Because I cranked it up too hard and I smoked the whole globe up, right? And he said, now you have to wait until it cools down. You have to wait until it's cool. And then we're going to have to take it apart and we're going to have to clean that globe out. Why? Because that was imperative that that globe was clean so that light could go forth. Beloved, as we're shining the light of Christ, may we shine it out of a life that is clean and pure for Him. May we realize that that candle or that lamp and uh, whatever it's talking about here, one of the one of the lamps that would have been commonly used at this time in in Jewish history was a small lamp with a wick in olive oil or something of the sort, and it would be lit and it would burn this this oil. But it, several things happened, and that was sometimes the wick got dirty and had to be thrown away. Sometimes they would have to replenish the oil. They tell me that these little lamps, the oil would burn rather quickly. And so it would have to be replenished often. So Jesus says, you don't just light a candle and hide it. You don't just light a candle and walk away. But it requires continual maintenance. Why? So that the olive oil doesn't run out. You see, that, that was the, the picture that He gave as He talked about the, the virgins awaiting the, the coming of the bridegroom. 
And some of them were wise and brought extra oil. And, and they arose when they heard the cry, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. And they arose quickly and they trimmed the wick. Why? So that it would shine brightly. And they restored the, the oil that was in their lamp. Why? So that it would continue to burn. And some of them were not wise enough to think it through. You know, they may have been living only for the moment and they didn't worry about it. They said, well, I have enough for right now, don't worry about later. And they arose and they said, "Uh uh-oh, we need to go, we need to get oil. And they were not prepared for the coming of the bridegroom. Speaking of the importance of living a life of preparedness before God. A life that is continually being fulfilled and filled by God and by His Spirit. Let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works. Are they seeing me doing good? Yes. But they aren't seeing me, are they? But they're seeing Christ that liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Why? So that I can take His light and that it can be shown through me. You know, the picture of the fact that we don't produce our own light, but rather we're a little bit like the moon where we reflect. We soak up the light of God's Word. We soak up the light of the Word of God. It becomes part of our life and it shines through us and it radiates out from us so that the world won't, doesn't just see you and I living a good life and, and, and producing uh, works of benevolence, but they see Christ in us, which is ultimately the hope of glory. You see, the glory of God shines in us and through us and creates within our life that desire to shine forth. The songwriter says, that we are to keep our windows clean so that the beacon of God's love, the beacon of God's light, the beacon may shine forth in a pure way. I have an aunt that likes to tell the story of a family who moves into a new community. And as mom is sitting at the table, she is looking out saying, Neighbor's wash is dirty. Why does she wash her wash? Doesn't she know how to run a washing machine? Or maybe a a scrub board, probably, when she was a little girl. Doesn't she know how to wash her, her wash clean? And week after week after week, she sat at the kitchen table criticizing the neighbor. One morning, Mama gets up and she says, Wow, what happened to the neighbor? Look at what the neighbor's... She got to wash her, her wash is actually clean this week, and her husband said, "No, I got up early and washed the windows." <laughs> you see, it's so easy to sit and criticize the neighbor's wash when it's me that should have been washing the beacon and making sure the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ is going forth in purity, going forth in its greatness, going forth exemplifying the purity and the reality of Jesus Christ in the land of the living. Why? Because He is the light that shineth. The light that shineth in darkness. We behold that light. We are saying, John says, I, I'm not that light. John the disciple wrote about John the Baptist saying, John was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. Beloved, you and I are not John the Baptist, but we are sent displaying that light to the world. It is important, beloved, I say imperative this morning that we shine that forth out of a heart of love and of purity in our lives. No, not because we don't make mistakes, but we allow God to change those mistakes even for His glory. Why? Because He is good. Not because I am faultless or flawless, but because He is and because He wants us to shine forth His light. So my question this morning, are you living that life 
filled with the Spirit of God. Just as that lamp was filled with olive oil time after time after time so it would continue to burn. Are we taking that time, that introspective look in our lives, are we taking that personal time in the Word of God saying, God, I want You to continue to spend, send Your Spirit to trim me, to fill me, to use me so that my lamp can shine forth Your light to those around us. In 1 John chapter 1, John talks about it. John talks about uh, the light of God. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This then is the message which you have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. In Him is no darkness at all. The lighting in this room is really good. But you know, you still have shadows. Why? Because the light doesn't shine through everything, right? Jesus said, I want to be, I want you to be so filled with me that my light shines straight through you so that there is not a shadow of doubt or a shadow of turning in your mind, but that as you live, as you live for me, you are so filled with me, you are so, so filled with, with me that you will understand that as John says here, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and we do not the truth. But if we walk in light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and his word is not in us. Beloved, this morning it is so important that we allow the light of God to fill us and to shine in us, to shine through us, so that those around us can see that there is a divine God who is interested not only in intervening for us, but instructing us in the ways of righteousness. As we walk in the light, the darkness vanishes. We're not hindered by the shadows of life, but we go forward living in Him. We go forward seeing Him for who He is. We go forward knowing that He is calling us into His marvelous light. This morning, as we look at and we see these first couple verses, there is nothing secret that will not be made known. And neither is there anything hidden that shall not come to bear. Take heed, <clears throat> therefore, how you hear. For what's, for whosoever hath, to him shall be given. And to whom, whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken, even which he seemeth to have. So we see the importance of light. Uh, going back to, you don't have to turn to this one, but go back in your minds with me to Exodus chapter, chapter, uh, 13. Verse 21, God sent that pillar of light by night to lead His people and to protect them from an evil Pharaoh who's running after them to destroy them. Remember that, that picture? Okay, and He sent that pillar of, of uh, cloud by day protecting them, overshadowing them, and that pillar of light by night, showing not only the overshadowing protection of His, of his uh, cloud, but the indwelling light of His protection as well. Psalm chapter 119, that big long chapter there in Psalms, we in the book of the Psalms. So many times I, I find myself saying the book of the Psalms. One individual psalm has no S on the end. Individually, it is a psalm. The book of Psalms is plural. So sometimes I, I catch myself saying it improperly. It is not Psalms 119. It is Psalm 119. So 
Uh, Psalm 119, verse 30, verse 130, says this, The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. I opened my mouth and panted, for I had longed for thy commandments. Look thou upon me and be merciful unto me, as, as thou uses used to do unto those that love thy name. Psalm 130, the entrance of thy words giveth light. The idea of the divine intervention of God. Thy words, they give light. They give illumination. Trying to understand how that the eye works, it's way beyond me. But it deciphers because of light. Uses light to decipher um, the colors that we see. It uses light to decipher what it what it uh, sees. So Matthew says, "If that light that is in thee be a darkness, how great is that darkness?" Matthew chapter six. Uh, there, on the, I think it's Matthew six on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus uses that illustration. If that light that is in thee is hampered by darkness then you can't decipher things properly. Consequently, I want to come, I want to indwell you, I want to be that illumination of your life so that you will be able to decipher properly between right and wrong. That is why God was so impressed when King Solomon comes to him at the beginning of his reign. And God says to Solomon, He says, what do you want in your, in your ministry? What do you want as king of Israel? And he says, God, grant for me that I might decipher between right and wrong. Grant to me that I can see properly so that I can judge between good and evil. So that I can judge your people between right and left, between right and wrong, so that they will know how to serve you. So that they will know how to walk. So that they will know what it looks like to have that divine intervention opening an entrance in their life. The entrance or the opening of thy word giveth light. It'd be fun to turn, to turn these lights off and see if the light would turn on, right? The opening of thy word. That's not what it says. But as we see the word of God, as God opens it before us, how does he open those truths to us? That's why it's important as, as Al brings us that list of of readings to do day by day, week by week, month by month, so that you can read through the Scriptures in a year. I'm not going to ask how many of you are keeping up with that. I hope all of you are keeping up with your reading, all right? Whether it's one verse, or one chapter, or one book a day. I say one verse. I like to say this very carefully. One verse properly meditated on is better than five books that we run through too fast that we miss them all, miss most of it. I say, beloved, spending time in the Word of God is paramount to God's people. That the opening of God's Word. It's not how much I read, how much I meditate, how much I think about. Some time ago, I met a, a pastor who spent a good many years in on the island of Grenada. And as he was there, he meets this man. He's an atheist. Doesn't believe there's a God. But he, he was a homeless man. But he had a Bible, and he kept it in his pocket all the time. And he died professing to be an atheist, but he could quote the Scriptures as good as a preacher could. But he refused to accept the truth that Jesus Christ was the only way to God the Father. So I'm saying, just knowing and opening the Scriptures isn't enough. But as we open the Scriptures, and as we allow God to speak to us through the Scriptures, we are blessed. Point number two, we are blessed to the point where we're brought to the place where we understand what it is to be part of the family of God. Our invisible God. Listen closely. Our invisible God infills His people, illustrating the light of God from an impartial God, 
illuminating our lives so that we can share the irresistible love of God and the image of His dear Son, His immeasurable kindness, His unlimited virtues of life to those around us. Isn't that ironic? You see, God is calling you and I to share who He is. The irony of it all is that God sent forth His Son in the fullness of time. He was made of a woman. He was born under the law. He came to redeem those who live all their lifetime subjected to the fear and the bondage of sin and death. And then He shares that with those twelve men. Question being, Jesus, what happens What happens if they fail? What is your second plan? I mean, obviously, what happens if they fail? Isn't that ironic? Jesus says, I don't have a second plan. Why? Because I'm going to infill these broken failures. All right, say that in quotes. I'm going to take these broken failures and I'm going to fill them with my Spirit and I'm going to send them forth in my power and in my strength because I want the world to know that there is a God in heaven. You see, that's the same statement that David used. That's the same idea that David used as he went to meet Goliath. David didn't go to show Goliath how big little little David was. He didn't go to show the world how big Goliath was. Can you imagine little David? I don't know how big David was. But he goes to this. How big was Goliath? Ten foot something? Huge. Huge. It was big. Yeah. And he goes to meet Goliath to show the world that there was a God in Israel. Praise God this morning for a broken little flawed shepherd boy that showed to us the importance of being filled with the Spirit of God and knowing what it was to be part of His family. To know what it was to understand. To know what it was to experience the filling of God in His land. Jesus came to show to us the importance of submitting to God the Father. Being part of God's family is a big endeavor. Romans chapter 8, verse 12 says this, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Alright, as, as uh, he comes here to uh, chapter 7, he is thrilled about the reality that they're no longer living under the Mosaic law. But now they're living in the freedom of Jesus Christ. But then don't take this freedom to the extent that, 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 it, that you get carried away with it. Don't use it as, as uh, something to fulfill the lust of the flesh, but allow this freedom in, in the Spirit of God to lead you. And then we struggle against that in chapter 7, starting at verse 7. We, you know, I know what I ought to do, but I, I often don't do that. And I know what I shouldn't do, but that's often what I do. And I, I get caught in this, this befuzzle. Right? I get caught in this, this struggle between right and wrong. Between what I should do and what I shouldn't do, what I shouldn't do and what I should do. And, and I get caught in this. And, and he comes out here and he, he, he cries out in the end of chapter 7, verse 24, Oh, wretched man that I am! Who is going to deliver me from all this mixed up mess that I'm caught in? This mixed up mess that we call life. Right? Who is going to deliver me from this bondage? of, of uh, the, the body of death. Chapter 8 starts by saying, There is therefore now no condemnation. Why? Because I thank God through Jesus Christ, this is the remedy for that mixed up societal mess that we see all around us. What is it? It's not, it's not constitutional amendments. It's not, it's not, the, it's not the acceptance of society. It's Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. 
Jesus is the one that answers that. Consequently, we come to chapter 8 and He says, there is therefore now no condemnation. Why? Because we're in Christ Jesus. We no longer live after the flesh, but we walk after the Spirit. We're now part of the family of God. That brings us to verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we're no longer debtors to the flesh. Why? Because our flesh has been crucified through baptism in Christ Jesus. It's been crucified. And we are raised together in newness of life. We're no longer caught in that confusion. Yes, yes. We walk through the confusion of life. We walk through those storms. But we realize that as many as are led, verse 14, by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. They are His sons. They are His children. They are the heirs of His kingdom. <clears throat> now therefore, ye are no more strangers. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. But your fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God. We're fellow citizens with who? The saints. Alright? Hebrews chapter 11. We talked about that two weeks ago. I think it was two weeks ago. The saints of old. Those saints who walked before. We are fellow heirs with who? The saints. The faithful who walked before us. We are fellow heirs with them. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We are part of His family. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That's Ephesians chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. For both he that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them his brethren. Praise God. Okay, that's point two, and I have about two and a half minutes to go over point three. Let me do it real quickly. and You go, you go home and meditate on, on point number three, and that's this one. Jesus lays down in the storm, and Gordon read it so beautifully this morning. It was, it was that, that, that gale or that, that squall that came upon them, and they were fearful. They are standing in, they are riding in the boat. They wake Christ up, and they said, we're ready to perish. Don't you care? Jesus' comment was, what are you worried about? What are you worried about? Beloved, do the storms of life worry you? It, <clears throat> let, me, let me do it this way. How many of you are not scared by the storms of life? <laughs> That's easier, right? I can count that number a little easier. <laughs> We're all intimidated by those storms of life, are we not? Amen. Why? Because those storms of life are real. And they come, and, and the enemy tries to use them to take our focus off the eyes of Christ, to take our focus off being part of His family, and, and to put our focus on the impossibility of the current struggle. The impossibility of what's happening around us. The impossibility of the storm. The, the possibility of sinking the ship. You with me? And the enemy wants to take that and, and intercept it all so that we fail to recognize that we're not only part of the family of God, but we're filled by His Spirit. And as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're part of my family. Beloved, this morning, the storm isn't to destroy you. The storm isn't to intercept you. The storm isn't to destroy your faith, nor your peace, nor your confidence in Jesus Christ. But that storm is to strengthen you in the midst of it. So that as we are sailing with the Savior, even though it seems like He's not there, maybe He's sound asleep in the midst of the storm. He wants us to trust Him to the extent that when He says to us, you know what? I want you to sail across the storm, across the sea, and I will meet you on the other side. Are you going to believe him? He says to his disciples, I'm going to be leaving you. I'll meet you on the other side. 